Okay, it looks like everybody who was in the waiting room is now up and running and has their video and or audio enabled and muted, right, everybody? Muted. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been doing this every week for a while now, and usually in the middle of the meeting or at the end, I've... Uh, Invited people to take three deep breaths, but uh, <clears throat> the longer this is going on and the more weary we are becoming, I'm going to invite us to start today's meeting with those three deep breaths. And so I can see a lot of people on video. Susie Rivera, I want to make sure that I see you um, follow my instructions. And so everyone, Casey Hardy, good to see you. Ready? One deep breath in. In, one more, in, please remember to do that more than once during the day. It's, um, it's not only good for your mental health, it's actually good for your lungs. And since we know what COVID likes uh, in our bodies, we want to keep those lungs as healthy as possible. So welcome everyone to the April 9th version of COVID-19 response for the balance of state. For those of you who can see the slide presentation, we have a cute little creature on the front uh, slide that says, hang in there and don't forget you're awesome. So I know that um, folks are getting tired and frayed around the edges. Uh, be kind to yourself and to others. We, once again, have a really packed agenda uh, and that we'll start with um, welcoming you all, updates from our partner organizations, uh, presentation for on the ground strategies. Today it's gonna be services for people with substance use issues, uh, presented by uh, my very own Sean Lang, Deputy Director of ACT. And then our takeaways and next steps, which are pretty much the same slides that you're seeing week after week. Again, we know we're giving you a lot of information in a short period of time. The slides will be available to you with all of the links, uh, with all of the additional information. Uh, so we'll take it from there with um, the announcements. Once again, we have links for all of the previous questions and any responses that we can give you. We encourage you that uh, if you have any questions, any needs, even if it's in the middle of the night, because many of us are not sleeping very well anymore, uh, <laughs> submit it to the ctbossCOC at gmail.com. Um, those of us who are awake in the middle of the night just might respond to you. So uh, <laughs> we, do, we want to keep this um, the line of information and communication open because every day things are changing. Uh, a reminder that CSH has got a supportive housing community platform as well. So uh, without further ado, we're going to do some quick updates with our partners beginning with the uh, Department of Housing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so we have really great news that Connecticut should be getting the stimulus COVID money under ESG and CDBG shortly. We've been having discussions uh, with our partners and internally how best to allocate that money. Um, so that will be coming soon. Uh, it looks like there'll be a second allocation of that ESG money based on areas that are hard hit by COVID. So we're hoping that we will be getting an additional allocation, but that hasn't been fully announced or fleshed out yet. Um, the biggest news is almost all of our shelter decompression has gone well and we've gotten about 
almost 900 hotel rooms under contract with DAS across the state to get people out of overcrowded shelters. I just jumped off the reaching home call where we started to focus on uh, unsheltered and people who uh, we may need to get into hotels. So that's uh, also in the works. Trying to keep the CAN system operating, although everyone's under decreased capacity and now working at sites. Um, most of the shelters are staffing the hotels, which is good. Um, and really saw some awesome collaboration where shelters are now working hand in hand in the same building, sharing staff, sharing donations and food. Um, so that's really been awesome to see. Uh, so that's really been the focus of this week. Um, another notice came out from DOH giving shelters some guidance on contract uh, obligations as far as HMIS reports, utilization. We're trying to be as flexible as we can. So we said, don't bother sending HMIS reports for the next three months. Uh, we know you're going to be underutilized and people are going to be all over the place. Uh, a survey, Bo created a survey that went out to shelters just so we could get a feel for where their staff are. Are they really down staff? Um, are they staffing the shelters? Are they staffing their own building? Um, and to try and figure out what our next steps will be. So that's been the summary of DOH this week. Um, I'm open for any questions in case I forgot anything, but major points were the new funding, shelter decompression and hotels, and uh, the contract memo that went out this week. Great, thanks, Kara. And a reminder that Welcome. we do have chat feature. Um, so use that at the bottom of your screen that we're recording this for future reference and um, that you should mute yourself when you're done talking. Um, Will do, muting now. And everyone else. Okay, um, CT Demas, Alice Minervino. Oh, did we fix Alice's tech problem? I don't know that we did. I don't know. Okay, I, I think the she was only in. thing she wanted to remind folks is that there is a critical incident portal on the Demas website and to make sure that you use that. Um, I can't speak to the details of that, but those of you who Can are... she speak? Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Shannon. Can you oh, hear me? Okay. Now we yeah. can. Yeah, so I I can't use my work computer to zoom in. So I'm using my personal iPad, but I had a call in, so I'm on two devices. So that's probably why there was some technical difficulty, which I should have probably told everyone in the beginning. Um, but I apologize. Uh, thank you, John. Yeah, Demas, we do have a portal, and uh, our commissioner is putting out um, pretty regularly, almost every day, provider alerts. Um, and one of which came out, it, it's the latest one, uh, came out a day or two ago, related to critical incidents um, regarding COVID positive and um, COVID related uh, deaths. So that's really good information. We do want people to report um, on crit using critical incidents on any positive cases and or uh, unfortunate deaths related to COVID and the instructions on how to fill the critical incident report out related to the COVID is on the is on the website. Um, you know, I know everyone's getting a ton of information and details and we, we have a lot of calls and meetings together, um, but just really want to focus everyone's our website has a lot of great resources um, for for the providers, but also there's been some updates um, as recent as today or yesterday afternoon related to some webinars for um, dealing with stress during this time and coping skills. So um, I know, you know, not everyone has a ton of time to take out to do more webinars, more meetings, but those might be of interest to you or your staff, particularly the ones around um, de-stress or coping mechanisms. Um, I think John's breathing is really helpful um, and at these meetings, but it's only once a week, so we probably need to do a little more for ourselves and our staff. Um, there is some funding coming 
from um, SAMHSA related to COVID that DEMAS will be applying for. Um, it is for the entire system, um, but we hope to have some that will be focused on um, some of the outreach efforts and support for um, folks in shelter. Um, so I know there's also been some questions related to uh, people who are in shelter or who are self-quarantining related to um, any, any medicated assistant treatment. There's um, the provider alerts related to that are on the website. So uh, I, I don't wanna uh, talk too much. I know Sean has a great presentation for us. So I, you can, you can re-mute me or, and, or I will mute myself. Thanks, Alice. Uh, do we have uh, a friend from CCEH here to give us an update? We do. We have Sarah Fox. Hey, Sarah Fox. Hello. I am hoping I'm not muted. You are not. We can hear you. Great. Woo. Okay. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, so a lot of what Kara outlined before, you know, we've been working closely with the Department of Housing and DEMAS um, and Richard. Um, is uh, at helping to lead uh, the homelessness response effort um, with many of our partners. Um, I think my role today is to give you an update on some of the information that we've been putting out there and um, the webinars um, that we've been conducting. Um, this, just this past week, we had a um, legislative webinar that we conducted um, with um, State Senator Anwar and State Representative McGee. Um, Commissioner Mascara Bruno and um, Dr. Lynn Sosa from the Department of Public Health um, to just provide an overview to, for legislators on the COVID-19 homelessness response and what's happening and what they're, what's happening in their districts and in their regions. Um, I'll be sending out all of that information to legislators um, within the day. Um, just, um, and that Kylie was also from the partnership was also on the phone and, and gave the um, the policy ask, um, but we just wanted to let them know, you know, what we're seeing, what's happening um, as they airs, as their constituent service people field calls um, so that they can provide them with the information, that, provide people with the information that they need. Um, we also, um, Liz asked me to provide an update on our webinars. Um, we just this last week, we did a few webinars outside of the legislative webinar we did one on preparing the homeless services and shelters for the novel coronavirus that can be accessed on the cceh.org website. Um, we also did one on addressing eviction and discrimination concerns during the crisis with the Fair Housing Center. Um, just this upcoming this Monday, we're going to be doing, and I think um, doing this in collaboration with DEMAS, the tips for case managing through the COVID-19 crisis. And then on Friday, we're gonna be doing an overview of the shelter decompression efforts. Is that all? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are doing a phenomenal job and uh, so appreciative of the work you're doing from the front lines all the way up into the legislature. So thanks, Sarah. Well, Sarah, this, this is Sean. Um, hey, Sean. We've been forwarding a lot of the stuff uh, that you've been sending out uh, to our case managers as well, whatever's relevant for them. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and we, um, I just sent to Liz all of the webinar information and then also what we are planning in the coming weeks. So you'll have that as well. Um, so you can click on, you can click on the webinars that have occurred or you can also register and send them on to your case managers if they want to sign up. Great, Great. We'll send thanks. That out. Thanks, Sarah. Wonderful. So those of you know that we've got a great, strong working relationship with our HUD field office, and Alana has been on a lot of our calls with us and other calls that you've all been on. Um, so is Alana here to give us the latest and greatest from her corner of the world? Uh, good morning, John. Yes, I'm here. Welcome. I hope that. I hope everyone is doing okay today. Doesn't look like the weather is going to cooperate with us on top of everything else. Um, but I had just a couple of things to share. Uh, I did this past week get electronic copies of letters from our acting assistant CPD secretary and chief elected officials 
out with regard to CARES Act funding, and those letters went to our uh, 23 entitlements, CDBG grantees who are receiving amongst the 23 of them a grand total of $24,165,675 of CARES Act funding. Um, I did also get the letters out to our five ESG grantees, and under this first tranche, a total of 11,988,303,000 has been awarded. Um, and just to follow up on what Kara said earlier, um, the SNAPS office got the original initial tranche of ESG funds out, one billion of the four billion that was allocated for ESG. There is three billion dollars left to be distributed. Forty million of that is going to TA, um, and the balance, as Kara had articulated, will go to ESG grantees um, hardest hit by COVID-19, and they're working on a formula uh, for that now. Um, she did say, you know, they're required under the act to distribute that within 90 days, but they are um, obviously working much faster and hoping to get that out uh, very soon. They are also working on a notice. It's on an expedited path. She doesn't know when uh, that guidance will ultimately be available, but she expects it will be very soon. So the letters that went out um, articulate for each of the chief elected officials what the flexibilities and conditions are with that funding that's been provided um, under the CARES Act. So we've at least uh, got that out the door. I, I have been, it's been confirmed to me that every grantee has received the letter. So at this point, um, they are aware of their award. We are awaiting um, additional advice and guidance for our grantees uh, beyond that, which is available in the mega waiver. Um, and with regard to the mega waiver, um, headquarters is having training with uh, CPD, with the field. They had one session yesterday. They're having another t today. And they hope to have something um, available that I can share with you next week. And what I found very helpful about it was they went through uh, each of the waivers and they talked about what documentation as a recipient you should have available and what should be in the client file. So it broke it down um, in that manner, which I thought was helpful. The one thing um, they did request that we point out to everyone is that even though the waiver came out on April 1st, the effective date of it is 331 2020 that's the date it was signed so anything that was given relief for you know two months six months a year from the date of the waiver the the official date of the waiver is 331 2020 um so they hope to have something for me next week that i will be able to share with you um they also intend to have something out on the amendment process for our entitlement grantees. Um, we think, we know for CDBG and, and we believe also for ESG and HOPLA, they'll submit, but we don't know that for certain yet. They'll submit a substantial amendment uh, to HUD and they can do that either off of their 2019 action plan, their 2020 consolidated plan that they're working on now um, and there may be some other flexibilities but those are the two that we're aware of right now um, so they hope to have something more for us to share with our grantees on that next week i've obviously gotten a lot of calls from our entitlements um, they're anxious to move it forward um, so i'll give you more information on that as i have it available and i think that's it for today unless there are any questions please that's great so everyone is muted except those who are presenting. So just a reminder, we're not gonna unmute you to ask a live question. We're asking everyone to use the chat box. And um, on the next slide, for those of you who are uh, seeing the slides, is the link to the daily uh, HUD uh, update and digest um, that um, Alana, provides to us in person. So thank you, Alana. Okay, so um, 
Updates from the uh, balance of state. Who wants to take uh, the next couple slides? That's me, John. All Thank right. you. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. Um, Good morning and thanks for coming today. So we're just gonna do um, some brief boss updates. Some of this is gonna be a repeat from um, last week about the waivers because we are packing these sessions with so much information. We wanna make sure we give people time to process it. But the first, just first update from the balance of state is that normally we have a, um, and that's actually the genesis of this weekly meeting. Normally we have a steering committee meeting on the third Friday of every month. And um, those are in-person meetings and obviously our world has changed. And we started actually these Zoom meetings with the first, our March steering committee meeting being a video conference. We are going to continue these calls uh, at least for the foreseeable future. And we'll be talking about that uh, today and with the chairs, uh, but we will have a steering committee meeting next Friday. Um, we'll have our regular COVID meeting at 11 and, and at 12, we'll take a break. And at 12.30, we'll have a very abbreviated steering committee meeting, hopefully done. We are scheduling 45 minutes, but we're hoping to be done in a half an hour. Um, and the meeting information is there and it will be sent out, uh, I believe, with an invitation. Yes, right, the way we normally do it. Um, so I, I think you know people know about the waivers. Alana just talked about it. There's huge flexibility um, that uh, HUD has uh, implemented for the programs that we work with. Um, and uh, this is just some basic information about how you request a waiver in the balance of state. Um, the majority of grantees are uh, sub-recipients under DEMAS and DOH. So uh, these, these waiver requests have been taken care of. But um, if you're not, if you are not a grantee, there's uh, information about if you are a direct grantee with HUD, sorry, or an ESG recipient that's not DOH, there's a link for you to uh, connect into how to make a waiver. Um, and you need to document in your records your justifications for the waiver use, and we'll be giving you more guidance on that, uh, some sample justifications. So the big news since our call last week is right after the call, Demas and DOH. Um, notified HUD of their intent to use the waivers. And so this applies to all COC and ESG projects where DEMAS or DOH is a grant recipient. So if you are a sub-recipient on uh, one of those grants, you do not have to submit um, a waiver uh, to HUD. But if you do have uh, funds directly, if you have a direct contract with HUD, there's the um, sample waiver template. And so since the waiver requirement uh, notification was submitted on April 3rd. Um, they are in effect two days later, which was April 5th. So we're well, well a week in on this. The waivers are not permanent, they're only temporary. So just on the, um, one of the big uh, uh, things I think that really helps us out with trying to house people quickly is, in, is a waiver on the physical inspections for housing quality standards. Um, and we have a lot of resources uh, for you and a memo was issued this week um, that has uh, clear dates and a grid that shows uh, each of these waivers and uh, their, um, their time frames. So you still need to, um, sorry, use a video chat or video streaming technology and there's, uh, you still, complete the form, you note that it was virtual, and you wanna make sure if you're doing a, a, a video um, uh, inspection that you identify that that's the correct unit in the video. Oh, I'm sorry, I pressed the wrong button, but no worries. Um, people are required to have a policy, and uh, there's a sample policy that is available on the website. Don't wait until you've written all your policies to um, uh, start taking advantage of this HQS waiver. As I said, it's in effect as of May 5th, but uh, please ultimately we are gonna need to get the paper uh, together on this. Okay. 
the annual reinspections for housing quality standards. I, I want to say about the initial inspection, sorry, I wanted to make one other point. Since we're trying to deconcentrate the shelters and get people into housing as quickly as possible, that waiver is just particularly important in, in that goal that you guys are working so hard on. So we are grateful for these waivers. The annual reinspections are um, waived until April 1st of 2021. No inspections required. Um, you should do reinspections uh, as necessary or feasible. Um, if people are in substandard conditions um, and they are not getting um, what they need, uh, we want to make sure that um, we are uh, taking action on that as, as much as, as we possibly can, obviously, in the context of this crisis. Um, other uh, big change is uh, the disability documentation um, for PSH. and. Um, we mentioned this last week, uh, so this is a, a repeat again, um, and that people can self-certify. And in particular, if that lack of documentation would be preventing them from accessing a, um, a permanent supportive housing unit, they can use this self-certification form. And there is a link to a, uh, a form for the state of Connecticut. Uh, last week, after our call, HUD had a webinar, and um, they confirmed that if people are admitted based on a self-certification or worker observation, um, that they are not going to have to get documentation going forward. And this is uh, great for getting people in, uh, but of course, in being good stewards of our resources, we want to make sure that wherever possible, we are obtaining third-party verification of disability um, whenever that's possible. Um, we also could obtain up worker observations, and, and that's an important thing to do, is an interim step until we ultimately um, do third-party verifications, and I'm sure we'll be talking about this more and more as uh, we get through the crisis and we get to the other side. Uh, PSH is obviously a limited resource, and we want to make sure that um, people are uh, long-term permanently disabled who are using those units. Um, the rapid rehousing case management uh, case management waiver is until April 31st, um, but DOH is requiring projects to at least make a contact monthly, but a safe contact using uh, phone or text, uh, video conferencing, uh, but not jeopardizing safety, um, but to try and make those contacts. I, I think we know that obviously our people are pretty vulnerable and um, checking in to make sure also that, you know, they're connecting with resources and what they need um, during the crisis is obviously critical. And I know most of you are keeping in touch with the folks you're serving. So just know that this rapid rehousing case management from HUD requirement is waived until only May 31st anyway, so it's not long term. Um, the one-year lease in permanent supportive housing, ha uh, which... Um, is the standard requirement is that you can only use uh, find rap rental assistance when uh, you have a lease or of a year, but they are waiving that so that any period greater than one month is acceptable. So you could have a two month lease that goes month to month. Um, DOH has applied this to their rapid rehousing programs through September 30th. We want to encourage people to still get a one year lease where possible, um, and there's benefits to that as we'll see later, um, but there's lots of benefits, of course, in terms of tenants' protections. Um, and the standard generally in Connecticut is one year, so you're not dealing like other states with lots of months to months, but try to get a one-year term, one year term. But if that's going to prevent someone from getting out of homelessness, obviously we want to take advantage of this flexibility. Just a reminder that we still need written leases um, for everybody. Um, another waiver is the fair market rent um, and we already had in continuum of care programs uh, the ability to rent higher than the fair market rent um, but for COC leasing projects which we have a few of in the balance of state not a lot um, and ESG rapid rehousing projects they can uh, waive that rule to only rent at the FMR um, or below. Uh, you still have to do rent reasonableness and you can't really do this increased rent if it's not consistent with what the market shows in the rent reasonableness uh, determination. And then of course, 
we only want to do this when necessary because if we rent at higher than FMR, that uses up the pot of funds that we have available so we can serve less people. Um, and then longer term, as especially with a rapid rehousing program, as people take over their own payment of the rent, if the rent is above FMR and it's, it's uh, unaffordable, that could create more instability or potentially returns um, to homelessness. So um, on that same HUD webinar last Friday that they apply, they uh, confirmed that the FMR waiver applies to the whole lease term. So another reason to get a one-year lease, because if you are going to rent at um, higher than the FMR, you will be able to make that payment throughout the, the lease term. Rent and utility arrears waiver. Um, on the supportive services uh, budget, those of you who have supportive services budgets in your projects, not everyone does, so we want to make sure that everybody realizes this is supportive services funds. Um, there's a budget line item for uh, rent and utility arrears, and you can pay for up to six months. Um, only when those arrears are preventing someone from getting into housing, and this is good until next April. Um, so you could use the um, funds to pay utility arrears so that they can get arrears, I mean, utilities turned on in the new unit, or paying rent arrears um, in order to get a new lease, but you cannot use this for eviction prevention, like we're gonna pay your rent arrears so your landlord doesn't evict you, although there is a moratorium on evictions right now, or we're gonna pay your utilities so they don't get shut off. And I believe in most jurisdictions, they're trying to not do shut offs. I'm not actually aware of whether there's, oh, there is, yes. Sorry, the link is, there's a, moratorium I thought on um, uh, evictions as well as utility shutoffs and the links for the utility shutoffs is there. My team will clarify if I, or jump in if I misspoke on the evictions. I believe we had that link in a previous um, uh, presentation. A couple of new uh, slides from last week uh, is that um, significant grant changes. The HUD is expediting amendments, and as we noted, um, our work with Alana Cable and her team is great. Um, if you are gonna make a significant change, you need to get a grant amendment with HUD, and that's shifting more than 10% from one budget line item to another, adding a new budget line item, and you would submit a request to the HUD field office, including why you need the request, but most, most important is that you don't reduce services in making this request of, or whatever grant amendment you're making. Um, mo if you're making a minor change, meaning less than 10% shift from one budget line item to another, or your project application wasn't, didn't include housing search and counseling and you want to expend, you want to notify the field office, don't need an amendment, and you also want to make a, a note into the files that you are uh, doing this so you have that for your record. Um, so there's also, as we mentioned, a memo from DOH, Demas, and CT Boss that was distributed this week that details really the narrative and a lot more of the um, specifics behind a lot of the slides that we just went through in terms of these waivers. Um, and there you have uh, a link to that. The CARES Act, um, as we've mentioned, and everybody knows about the CARES Act, is wonderful, the money is coming down, and um, notices, as Ilana mentioned, will be forthcoming and more guidance. Uh, wanna, this does include a, a moratorium on evictions, um, and uh, you have the information before you. So the information about CARES Act benefits for clients is emerging, it's evolving information. Um, there's some links here about uh, uh, the distribution of the CARES Act checks and the unemployment benefits. Um, there are scammers out there, so we want to make sure that people are aware that there are scammers out there. I think one thing people are very concerned about is that a lot of our folks are not as Social Security recipients and did not file tax returns, but they would be entitled to those um, one-time checks. And so we are going to certainly try and uh, find out uh, how that might be um, accessible to our people. Uh, Great. Suzanne. Okay. Yes. Take Sorry, a deep I breath. know I was talking very fast. I, 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 I don't think you took a breath the whole time you were speaking. But All right. only... well, that probably means it's time for breathing, John. Yes, time for breathing. So everyone, 
Deep breath in. Deep breath out. Deep breath in. Deep breath out. Deep breath in. Deep breath out. I only know one person who can speak faster than Suzanne Wagner and go through more slides than Suzanne, and that's Sean Lang, who's gonna go through a lot of really good slides. She's not gonna talk through each of them. They're gonna be available to you after our time today, but just sort of keeping in mind that uh, the folks that we work with with substance use issues uh, have some particular needs that we need to be concerned about. So Sean, Take it away and I'll give you a three minute warning. All right, I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so how do we advance the slides? Say next slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> next slide. All right, so harm reduction, I think a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, it's a perspective, it's a set of evidence-based strategies to reduce negative consequences of drug use. And we incorporate a spectrum of strategies from safer use to abstinence. Next slide. Sorry, little technical difficulty here, Sean. There we go. Okay. So um, I was asked about um, syringe services programs and if they've changed since the advent of uh, COVID-19. All programs around the state are still operational, but many have uh, adjusted their hours. So we suggest it's best to call ahead. Um, and I put a link there that you can link to the other uh, programs to get information about the SSPs and drug use help. Um, and then uh, the programs also provide HIV and Hep C testing, OD kits, safer crack kits, fentanyl test strips, safer sex kits, and referrals to other services. Next slide. So we try to reduce um, stigma and consider the language that we use in talking about people who use drugs. So we want to use person first language and accurate health terminology, avoid stigmatizing language. We refer to people um, as people with an addiction or with a substance use disorder instead of referring to them as addicts. Although many people who consider themselves in recovery refer to themselves as addicts, that's a personal thing. Uh, describe individuals as abstinent rather than clean because we know the opposite of clean is dirty and we don't want to convey that to um, our folks. And refer to methadone and buprenorphine as medications rather than drugs or replacement therapies. Next slide, please. So, the treatment options, the liveloud.org um, has a lot of great information. It's a really rich website, so I highly recommend uh, you take a look at that. Uh, not everybody requires or benefits from inpatient uh, hospitalization or detox. Detox alone is associated with high rates of relapse. And the most effective treatment for an opioid use disorder involves medications, as I mentioned in combination with counseling and support services. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit of a risk assessment um, for the risk of overdose is uh, anyone who uses opioids for long-term management of pain or recreationally um, are at risk of an overdose. People who have overdosed previously, those who use alone, People who are recently released from prison or treatment or any other period of abstinence, even short term. Uh, people who mix opioids, especially in combinations with benzodiazepines uh, and alcohol. And uh, quality of people's drugs can be unpredictable. And as we know, we've seen uh, much like an incredible increase in um, uh, fentanyl being involved in other uh, drugs, uh, which uh, you know, contribute to the high overdose rates we have. How it's administered, if um, people inject, obviously it goes directly into your uh, bloodstream. And people who have other health issues, people who are older, people with heart, liver, kidney disease, heart disease, um, HIV and AIDS and malnourishment also impacts uh, their overdose risk. Next, please. Naloxone or Narcan, people have heard about this. It's an opioid antagonist. 
it can only reverse an opioid overdose. So if you it gave yourself naloxone, nothing would happen, has little or no adverse effects, stays active for 20 to 90 minutes, and people can have a variety of responses when they come to. Next, please. Um, nasal spray naloxone, it's very easy to administer. You peel back the package, you take it out. We recommend people not put their thumb on um, the nozzle until uh, they have it in the person's nose. Then once it's in the person's nose, flush the, flush the oh, excuse me, pl press the plunger firmly, say that three times fast, um, and wait for three to five minutes. And if they're not responsive, then you wanna do a second dose. Um, we also say call 911 immediately to get that ball and roll because the first responders will come pretty quickly and can take over from there. Next. Who should have naloxone? Everybody. Um, it should be in every medicine chest at your home, every first aid kit, uh, school nurse's office, but anyone who completes uh, or released incarceration or opioid detox or treatment, anybody who's been absent for a long time should have access to naloxone. People with prescription opiates, this isn't just for people who inject drugs, but people have prescriptions. And um, any programs working with staff or clients or family members who fit these descriptions. Next, where do you get Narcan? You can get a prescription from your medical provider. Uh, there's a link to certified pharmacists that you can um, find out a pharmacy in your area where you can get it. If a person's on Medicaid, they pay for the full cost of uh, naloxone. Um, but if you have commercial insurance, you'll have some copay depending on what kind of insurance you have. Uh, and programs can order directly from the manufacturer. Next, please. So how has COVID-19 impacted harm reduction services? DPH sends an almost daily email to their funded programs with updates on how folks are operating now. So this is an ever-changing scene, as you well know. And again, most uh, SSPs or drug user health programs have curtailed hours and days, but are still providing services. And I think it's still a little too early to tell about how it's impacted. Uh, I did talk to our director of harm reduction and prevention, and they haven't seen a huge shift in uh, the client behavior. So um, we'll keep you posted on that. Next. Um, substance use treatment during COVID-19, uh, the bed availability website is still being updated by providers. This is on the DEMIS website. Some have temporarily reduced their census. Um, Merit Hall Detox and one other private nonprofit detox have stopped admissions. Um, inpatient admissions haven't changed. And outpatient services are offered remotely through telehealth. Uh, DEMIS is not aware of any fast tracking. Next, please. These are the resources. Uh, Nora is Naloxone Opioid Response Application. It's a web-based application that contains a lot of great information. Uh, SSPs, the syringe services programs, you can find out where those are. Uh, overdose Trends, SWORD, uh, which I always forget what it stands for, but you find that in emergency medical service on the DPH website but it's a monthly um, newsletter that contains a lot of information about uh, overdoses around the state. Uh, the Connecticut Center for Harm Reduction and the DEMIS bed availability uh, link. Next, please. And I did it. How was that, John? Good job. You, uh, enough for like you, bra you breathe, Sean. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Suzanne. No, that's good. <laughs> All right. That's and great. one last thing I'd add is uh, when this plague is over, um, I'm happy to come to any of your programs to do a longer harm reduction overdose prevention uh, training. Thanks. And there are a couple more uh, links after the contact information that folks uh, can reference once you get these slides in front of you. Um, so what we've tr wanted to do but have not uh, been very successful in the past is we've bumped right up against time. Um, but what we want to do is see if there are any questions in the chat boxes that um, 
people uh, from Housing Innovations can answer on the fly. Um, is someone? Yeah, I can do that. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, there was one that came in that we answered in the chat, but for people that maybe aren't able to see the chat, it's probably a question that others have. So the question is, if you notified HUD that you are exercising the waiver that allows you to use uh, money on the housing search and counseling line in your supportive services budget to pay for rental and utility arrears, do you have to notify them again about a minor change in your contract? And the answer to that, I think, and Alana will jump in if I'm wrong about this, is that if you already had money when you did your project application in the housing search and counseling line, then there's nothing additional you need to do other than filing the waiver notification. If you did not already have money in that line, then it's probably prudent to notify HUD that you want to expend on that on that line. And then you would just keep that, you would just keep that in your project files for future monitoring. Great. Are there other questions that people want to submit into the chat box? No, okay. just a question about um, the logic around months to months leases. Um, and I uh, you know, for HUD, it has always been a really strong tenant to maintain the one-year lease requirement. In a lot of the country, the standard is actually month-to-month -month leases. And so it becomes a huge barrier in those communities that tend and states that skew towards month-to-month -to -month leases, which is actually a lot of states in the West. So it may come up in here in Connecticut. Um, so, but of course, we're still encouraging one-year leases. But it's a huge barrier in lots of other parts of the country. So, and there's been a lot of lobbying to change the standing requirements on the one-year lease permanently. Are there other questions in the chat box that we think we should take while we're together? I'm Did you see this question from Amanda? Maybe Sarah can address. Any guidance thus far on our clients with alcohol dependence is they're at risk of dying from withdrawal? very concerned about this population. I see that uh, Mark Jenkins uh, responded to that with uh, his contact information. Mark is with the Greater Hartford uh, Harm Reduction Coalition. And so folks in the Hartford area uh, can reach out to him through his contact information that he's posted. Um, the reminder that next week is um, back on Friday, because many folks have tomorrow as a holiday, and we're gonna spend a little bit more than three deep breaths in and three deep breaths out. We're gonna talk about supporting staff, and that includes us, um, but we knew that if we said this was just about supporting you and your self-care, none of you would show up. So we're going to target it uh, toward your staff so that as good managers and uh, directors you'll show up because you'll know it's something that you um, can pass on to your staff but we're, we will definitely make sure that you're included in ways that we can support staff during these hard times and promote self-care. We know that folks on the ground have already experienced death of clients as well as staff people. We know that um, you haven't even had a second to grieve those losses. And so we, we wanna at least spend some time next week not focused on a lot of the laws and the, uh, the waivers and the templates, but really sort of uh, spend some time doing some self-care. If there are no other questions, we'll make sure that you get these uh, slides out to you. The, the slide after our next steps are, continue to be the, uh, the links to self-care as well as COVID resources. Um, and then the last slide as always is our wonderful staff at Housing Innovations that keeps us 
moving forward with uh, positivity and good energy. And so we tip our hats to them this morning. And with that, I believe we are going to give people seven minutes back. Can we do that? I see Susie smiling. I see Kellyanne smiling. So uh, Terry I Nash to is smiling. Just I, like I, to make sure there's nothing else in the chat that we that is important or. Okay. And just a reminder that um, the chat uh, uh, dialogue is also captured for posterity, and that we will make that available as well. And if there are questions that are pending, we can always circle back and give them to you. And those will be found in that link that we started our presentation with, uh, which is uh, ctboss.org backslash COVID-19 resources. Okay, folks, have a nice long weekend if that's what you're doing. And if you're back in the trenches tomorrow, just know that we are with you in spirit. God bless. Take care. Thanks, John. Thank you.